Well, hello there, Road Church. I hope and pray you're having a blessed day. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us here today. Well, today I'd like to start a theological series on the study, uh, the, the study of the doctrine of salvation. Now, this is a, a huge subject, full of debates, uh, full of different sides, which all, all subjects have their different interpretations of Scripture. So I wanted to take time to give understanding in what can be a confusing uh, subject. In, in this video, I want to outline four major players on the field. And what do they stand for? Uh, what we can clearly see by overviewing the subject. Um, you know, is there is there a clear order of things in Scripture? We'll kind of get into that. Um, but you know, a lot of it comes down to how how salvation works. You know, personally, I've I've been to uh, schools that have taught one side or the other. Um, my first Bible college that I went to actually taught uh, that you could lose your salvation, uh, which in fact I totally disagreed with upon then and now. And I've been taught at a, you know, both both were great schools. I, I'm going to, you know, clarify that and say they're an amazing blessing. Both schools, I, I highly uh, state you know, hey, these, these are really good schools. I learned a lot, you know, and we'll get into that subject a little bit more too. Um, but the other school taught that, you know, God elects. God, you know, elects who will be saved. That's something that I, I totally agreed with at the time, and now I've come to understand that in a different light as, as we'll go in, I'll, I'll show you. Oh, and now it brings me to you know being a pastor on the eastern plains of Colorado, where I've had conversations with some on on one side or the other, and I came to see that both uh, two of these answers, right? You know, uh, were really religions trying to understand or interpret the grace of God found in Christ Jesus our Lord. I now personally stand with the camp of provisionism. You know, I want to say that you know God has love and provision for all. You know, I I, I want to declare that. I, I personally don't want to you know have fights online. I I love talking about this uh, interpersonally, especially with people that really enjoy the conversation. There seems to be a lot of people that you know whether they're on this side or that side of the debate, do not uh, want to talk about it anymore. They've kind of just dug in and said, this is, this is where I stand. And hey, that's, you know, that's personally okay. I really enjoy talking about this. I feel like, you know, sides of the issue are really like, no, this is a salvation issue. And we'll kind of get into that, that if you disagree with this, you're literally disagreeing with how the gospel works and therefore are a heretic. Uh, both sides are kind of on that spectrum of, of saying to one or another, hey, why don't we just call them what they are and say they're false teachers, they're false believers. I really want to talk about this as it is a household fight of those inside the household of the Lord. That this is something that we need to, as brothers and sisters in Christ, deal with in grace and love with one another. I want to respectfully disagree with one side or the other, knowing full well that I have learned great deals of, of biblical truth from either side, that I've still and still gain knowledge from different sides of this argument, you know, that we need to learn from either side. And then, yes, I, I want to offer my two cents. Yeah, I want to be up front with you in this subject because I feel like a lot of biblical teachers are not up front with this subject that they are on team over here they're on team over here and it's just like no I want to say hey I I have looked at it through my journey I have you know been over here I've been over there and I'm kind of like okay both sides you know learning from both sides and kind of like say 
there's got to be something else. And that's really, you know, where I've come to, you know, yeah, provisionism. God has provision and love for all. And I really want to just take time to say that if you like this content and you like the other Bible-related content, content, content on the subject matters that uh, pertain to applying the word to today's culture and applying scripture and learning to to objectively study scripture and to uh, just dive into theological uh, subjects, uh, go ahead and uh, subscribe to our channel, share uh, share this video, get get this information around. You know, maybe there are, and, and I know of different uh, different ministries that are all about this. I, I kind of wanted to dip my toe into it a little bit. Um, but if you enjoy these videos, please, you know, like them, subscribe, uh, share them. Um, but go, going back into the conversation is that it's it's good to talk about these things because I feel like there's a lot of people that have come out on online and, and different things of like, you know, oh, I thought this this was Christianity and this is the only view on the subject that, you know, there's a lot of people that are just saying, forget it. You know, if that's if that's what Christianity is, I'm I'm not for it. You know, where it's just like looking at this is this this is a huge issue that it's like, wait, you know, we believe that the God of the Bible is a God of grace. The God of the Bible is a God that, that calls humanity towards himself to come and reason together. And that in the Lord and turning to the Lord, your, your sins will be as white as snow. Though you are stained, stained with blood, you can be made clean and given new garments in Christ our Lord. You know, a great book that I'd like to recommend if anyone is uh, wanting to look into the history of this subject, it's it's the foundation of Augustan Calvinism by Dr. Ken Wilson. And that's more of like a, a history on uh, Augustine's framework and theology and where it came from. It's It's a really good book. Uh, and it's it's not that much on on Kendall, and it's it's a short read. It's uh, it's under a hundred pages long. I think it's like eighty eighty some pages long. Um, but here today, I just want to give the basic understanding of of these views, and I I really was looking it over, and it's like yeah, we we want to look at Calvinism, we want to look at Arminianism. I kind of want to briefly overview uh, free grace theology, and then uh, end with provisionism. So, you know, I want to ask some questions uh, as we as we go through it as well. Uh, I found some pretty good uh, graphs on this, so we'll just kind of read through them and then ask some questions as well. So, uh, Calvinism starts with uh, total depravity, and it states that humanity is dead in sin and is unable to respond to God. God must regenerate only the elect. The pre-chosen few, so that they are un so that they are able to believe. The non-elect, uh, also called retrobate, retrobates, are never given any chance to be regenerated at all. Unconditional election. It goes on here. Uh, God's election of those who will be saved and will be condemned has nothing to do with man's response of faith. Salvation is through election by God's eternal decree. And then limited atonement. Christ died to save only those who were pre-selected, the elect, by God's eternal, by God in eternity past. The non-elect have no hope for redemption at all. Irresistible grace. God draws on the elect, only the elect, to salvation and makes the elect willing to respond. This grace cannot be obstructed or resisted. The non-elect will never be drawn or, or able to believe at all. And then it ends with uh, 
the per perseverance perseverance of the saints. The truly elect will persevere in salvation because God ensures that none of the elect will be lost. So I really want to stop right there and say this is a huge stumbling block to a lot of people. Uh, I know a lot of great and grand believers in the Reformed Calvinistic faith. I've learned a lot from a lot of different pastors that are all about this, and this is the soteriological or the, the study of doctrine uh, view of Scripture that they hold to. Now, this is a very deterministic view of Scripture. This is looking at several passages in Ephesians and in Romans and stating that this is what is. This is the grandiose plan of God, and everything is forwarded. I think the biggest question that I have for people on this side is, why the cross then? It, if it was just going to be this electoral view, and it's all by special grace, then why did the Son of God even have to die? And I know that might sound like an odd question, but it really kind of uncomplicates a lot of issues because it's like if this is the thing, then why didn't it just happen? Why, why aren't those people just saved and it just goes on? Why did the Son of God get lifted up? You can go and read in John 3 that he is lifted up so all may see him, that he will draw all to himself in John 12. This is a huge part of it that the, the cross happens in order that all of humanity can come to God. You know, if, if all does not mean all, what does it mean? If we, if we can't read the scripture and state that for God so loved the world, that he gave his son that whoever, right, whoever, even if the whomsoever is not there like it is in the King James, it's still a whoever believes on him will have eternal life. You know, he, he died for our sins as he died for the world's sins. You know, it's, it is, the, the grace is available to all. There is huge questions there. You know, if, if you go to, you know, irresistible grace, we can look at the entirety of the Old Testament and say, well, how how is Israel able to resist the will of God? How 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 is the church in its sinful state, even in today's world, able to resist the will of God? These are these are questions that I would ask you to to wrestle with as as I've wrestled with um you know, you go back to do total depravity, and a lot of Calvinists would say that we are like Lazarus, dead in the grave. That that is an illustrative point of Calvinism, saying that we are, we are dead in the grave like Lazarus. Yet, we can see clearly that that passage of Scripture is clearly talking about Jesus' resurrection. That it is a, this is a purpose, like, that you would believe in me. And that even though you die, like Lazarus died, you will live in me because I am the life and the resurrection. Like it's pointing not to, oh, you're dead in sin and so you need me to breathe into you. And then, you know, it's, it, it has nothing to do with salvation in that passage. If you go read it, it has everything to do with the fact that Christ is going to be resurrected. And that life is found in him. And that whoever believes in him has eternal life. You know, so is that a is that a biblical view of humanity? You know, as we'll look into Arminianism and free grace and provision theology, we can see that that's not the only view. That is not the only way of looking at humanity. That it is totally depraved, worm-like, you know, un unwilling. Right? You know, it's like yes, we've all gone our own way, but if we hear this offer. Like, if we're given a gift, do we throw it back in their face? That's a choice. Do we throw it back in their face, or do we eagerly receive it and say, thank you? That's a choice. Choice is on the table in the biblical context. Therefore, determinism doesn't work out. Fatalism doesn't work out. If there's, if there's choice in the matter, which we can see throughout the biblical text, 
then determinism is is kind of ruled out kind of is is ruled out and determinism is different than sovereignty i know a lot of people would define sovereignty as determinism that that god has made all of these things happen that is definitely as you can read from dr kent wilson and the foundations of augustine calvinism uh, which i should link below um let me write that down uh, so i can help out people uh, learn more right because uh, that's that's what we're here for and I don't I don't mean to anger people or anything I want to ask good biblical questions that as we look at that view of things we can see it is more paganistic in its thought that that there is something here that we are given stewardship we are given choices we have something before us life or death we, we have these choices that will we apply wisdom to life, you know, even as believers. As we get into it, you can see that the perseverance of the saints is yet another grace. Is something that, as it states right here, the truly elected will persevere in salvation because God will ensure it. It ensures it. It's, a, it's another grace given. Yet, again and again in Scripture, it says, don't drift away. It says, walk worthy of the calling. Go forward in this. Pay attention. This seems to be a choice as well that even though we are free from the condemnation, from penalty of sin, we in our sanctification, in our walk, are, are called to walk worthy of the calling. To, to gather up, not to, you know, walk in, in a fear-based theology of, of what, well, am I saved? I mean, that literally is a religion, and we'll, we'll get into that conclusion here in a little bit as we talk about Arminianism first. Are we walking in freedom? You know, as we go into our Arminianism, well, actually, I want to say one more thing about Calvinism. So, in this view... That it is God, right? It is God who carries it all out, right? That's, that's why they, you know, this whole spectrum of it is that God carries it out. The view of Calvinism here is that you cannot disagree with them on how salvation works because then you are disagreeing by why it all works and it is by the grace of God. The, the argument is good, right? Because it stops people in their tracks. But the order of things is this is that God offers. You can see that clearly through Scripture, and therefore Calvinism is unbiblical because it's not just a deterministic thing. It is that we go out and we tell people, well, well why, would, why would we tell people of a hope they cannot have? It's a hope for all men and women. It is a hope that, as Paul talks about in Acts 17, in front of Mars Hill in Athens is that he's ordered all these things. He's given us all of our abodes that we might seek him out. Now that's, that's not determinism. That's providence. That he has providentially put us everywhere. And, and maybe we'll even have that. We'll have time to look at all these definitions and to see how, how they are defined. That would be a good video study. Because as we can see that any kind of teaching, whether we're dealing with cults or whether we're dealing with different thoughts, it's, it's good to define terms and to see where these things mean. Is that if, if you mean determinism by sovereignty, that all of everything is happening because God is, is orienting all of the world. Or if you mean providentially that he's... he's brought everything to the table in a certain way that we would have the ability to look upon the man, Jesus, who draws all of humanity to himself. That's, that's a different view of things, you know? But Calvinism really brings that into, you know, perspective that if you disagree with them, you're disagreeing with 
that it is all by the glory of God. And in no means are we disagreeing with that. It is all by the glory of God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 really talk about that, you know, that it is all by God, that it is all of God, that humanity in and of themselves cannot do anything. I agree with that, that we are insufficient, that there are insufficient funds in our bank account to make our way to the dwelling place. And therefore, by Christ, we have free will. We have the will to choose that or not. We have salvation in him because of him, and we have choice because of his will, because of his, his providence. So going on to Arminianism is what is called diminished depravity or de deprivation. Humanity is dead in sin and is unable to respond to God, but God's prevenient grace given to all people by the Holy Spirit restores every man's ability to respond to God. So this is definitely like a view of like, yes, we agree because, and Dr. Kent Wilson talks about this. Um, it might not be in his book, but it was in a couple interviews that I saw, I think, uh, where both Calvinism and Arminianism are, are on the same spectrum. They are just different different parts of that spectrum where it's like we need to move past that and see what what the Bible says so and, and you can see that right here is that yes we agree with Calvinism we agree with what it states but we also state that the Holy Spirit has given the ability for all of man to be re revived in a sort of way so it is already stating the same thing that it's like it is only by by God that we're even able to have choice where it's that that is more of a but we'll get into that more, is that that is something that isn't, isn't broken in man, that we have the ability to hear the good news, to receive the good news, and to accept it. And then we become new creations in Christ. But jumping, jumping ahead. <laughs> so then we come into the view of election from the Arminian standpoint, God bases his election on foreknowledge of those who freely choose to respond to Christ in faith. Those who believe in Christ now are elect in Christ. So this is more of the corridors of time view that you've probably heard in Sunday school or even from a sermon that, that God looked through the corridors of history and saw everyone that would believe upon him and elected them. That, that he, he saw that where it seems very, very good like it seems it sounds okay but it's it's kind of like yet again that whole you know deterministic theology of of well this is how it all works out and this is a, a different view kind of like supplanting it but at the same time it's like it's it's to whomever it's to the whoever and then it goes on to atonement. Christ died for everyone, making salvation possible for everyone. His death is effective to the whosoever believes in Christ. And this this sounds pretty biblical, right? You know, it's like it's it's effective to to anyone. It's it's applied to anyone that turns, and that is that is a true statement that anyone who who turns to Christ is saved. And going on about uh, grace, whether it can be resisted or not. God calls everyone to salvation. People can freely receive or freely reject God's grace. Those who choose to believe in Christ will be given eternal life. Now that, that seems to kind of line up with, with what free grace and provision would say. But it's also kind of like, wait, you know, there's this, you know, everyone's supplanted with the Holy Spirit. Everyone's kind of given a seed whether they can reject it or not whereas we'll see that free grace and provisionism disagree with that and the factoid of of that it's it's not in you it's around you and whether you you take it or not is is the choice and then it goes on for justification the, the ending part that salvation can that the saved can fall from grace and lose their salvation believers are saved as long as they choose to remain in Christ. So this is this is where I wanted to share that in my first school I was I was labeled a Calvinist because I believe 
believed then and believe still now that you cannot lose your salvation. But as I, as I came to understand, and I, I gladly accepted that title. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, I was kind of like, eh, but that unlimited atonement thing didn't sound right to me. And now it looks like it looks at, I look at all of it and like, it just doesn't, both of these don't sound right to me. You know, don't, they don't sound biblical. I came to understand clearly that as you can look at, you know, the perseverance of the saints is that Calvinism states it as well as that you can lose your salvation, which brings me to the conclusion about both of these theological views is that they are wrong because they are religions, kind of like a married couple saying the same thing, but in a different way, right? You ever been in those conversations of, no, we're going to do it like this. No, we're going to do it like this. And you're saying the same thing, but you're saying it different ways. That's, that's Calvinism and Arminianism in a nutshell. Is that they are trying to understand the grace of God found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So... The next one that we want to look at is free grace. Now this one, I think a lot of um, people have labeled it cheap grace. A lot of people that have fought against it uh, from the Reformed community or even the Reformed uh, thought of, of life is that, you know, both Arminianism and Calvinism, you know, they have a lot of different views on different things. I don't want to, you know, there's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of people that would say, well, even what I read right there, isn't Calvinism. Oh, you're missing a lot of nuances. Same with Arminians. There's a lot of people that I know that would say this, that, or the other. But when I first came to Christ, I knew a lot of Arminians. I disagreed with them on the loss of salvation. I had a couple different run-ins with different people that I was just like, you know, even looking back, I'm like, I'm not too proud of how I handled that. I I would say I've I've handled now that I know a lot more of the Reformed Calvinist tradition. I, I've handled that a lot better, where it's just like it seems the way they talk about provisionism and free grace. It's like oh that's that's cheap grace, that's you know and that's another tactic of well see you're 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 not about the glory of God. You're not about the grace of God. And it's like no what we need to. Do, do is say, okay, forget these straw men, forget those kind of things, and look at how the Bible says, how does this work? How how does it work? Because if we don't understand that, I agree with them sincerely, if we don't understand how it works, then how are we actually sharing the truth? Are we sharing it rightly? I mean, that's a huge thing. We need to know that. So going on to the free grace, it states that humanity as sinners can do nothing to earn God's grace. Each person is liable for their own sin, but they can choose to believe in the gospel. Salvation by grace is offered to all sinners as a free gift received only through faith. I mean, that, that just sounds amazing, right? You hear that and it's just like, yeah. You can look at scriptures like in Ezekiel, and elsewhere that it's personal responsibility that we have all fallen short of the glory of God we have all fallen short of the holy standards of the Lord and therefore we have this life made manifest apart from the law and the prophets though the law and the prophets attest to it that is a life made manifest in Christ Jesus our Lord and if we believe upon him we have salvation amen goes on to talk about election. God's election is never unto salvation, but is an office, position, service, or blessing. God chooses the church, all believers, to become holy, blameless, and complete in Christ. See, and that's part of the argumentation, right, about the election. What is that written to? Is that written about the whole of how everything works? We're taking one thing and applying it to everything, or is it about the church, that we are chosen, that we're set here, that we're positioned here to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to be about sanctification, to walk worthy, and to point others to this amazing person 
this amazing Son of Man, Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has come for us. Now going on with uh, atonement, the death of Jesus was sufficient to pay for the sins of the entire world, not only the elect. His death is effective to the whosoever believe in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I mean, that's, that's John 3.16 right there, the most well-known verse in the Bible, that whoever believes upon Christ Jesus, our Lord, has eternal life, that whoever calls upon his name, that whoever trusts in him is born from above. Whoever receives him is not born of flesh or spirit or the will of man, but born of God. And that's first, uh, John 1, 9-13. through 13, That whoever receives him has eternal life. That if we are in Christ Jesus, we therefore have no condemnation. We are free from the penalty of sin. It goes to talk about grace. God's grace is unlimited in the sense that it extends to all people who have decided to receive it or reject it. Those who choose to believe in Christ will be given eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all on that. Yet we're all offered this gift to take it or not. And that is the grace of God. That is everything. This is of God. And that those that have received it are, are now ambassadors, preaching it out, pouring it out, that through Christ Jesus, we can be made right. That we can be made the righteousness of God because he became sin for us. For all of us. Now people will look at those verses and interpret them, well, it just is talking to the church. It's talking to the elect. The Calvinist, the Arminian can look at that and say, well, see, it's, it's only for these people that are preordained one way or another, depending on your view, the high determinist or the low determinist, I guess, and really coming into, no, it's the whoever. It's a free gift offered to all that, that grandma doesn't just pick one child and say, well, it's you, Johnny. And the seven others are like, well, I wanted rollerblades too, Grandma. You know, it's like, no. And Grandma has gifts and love for all, right? And that we can either receive it or reject it. And it goes on talking about eternal security. A Christian has eternal security because of the power and promise of God. That, that this is a thing that if, if you're... You know, like me when I was young, struggling with, with this, and I think that's why you know perseverance of the saints really, really kept me, you know, comfortable. Is that no? It's it's the factoid, <laughs> it's the fact, the truth, the reality that we can trust the God who keeps His promises, that it's not some other kind of special grace or something that you can you know, hit a bump on the road and somehow lose your salvation which it sounded very like that, that that it sounded very much like that when I was first encountering a lot of Arminians. That it's not something that can be cheaply misplaced, but it's something that is grand and powerful because we have trusted in the person and in the work of Christ Jesus our Lord. I'd like to take a little bit of time to go through uh, provisionism as well. I know this is a longer video, but I really have enjoyed this and if you enjoy these these longer ones you know let me know <laughs> uh, if not we can keep them we can keep them shorter but provisionalism says this people sin humanity is totally sinful which separates sinners from God we are incapable of saving ourselves a divine provision i.e. the cross and the gospel became necessary and this is the thing that comes into the, you know, we agree in one way or another, we all agree that humanity is sinful. Humanity is unable to make his way to God. Yet, time and time again, free grace and provisionism are, are looked at as heretical for some reason or another. Well, you just are robbing God of glory. You are robbing 
the, the gospel of its power. And it's like, no, the, the cross and the gospel are the provision of God going out to all of humanity. Responsible. Everyone is able to respond to God's appeal for reconciliation because divine provision will be heard and understood. That the gospel goes out. That general revelation goes out. That there is a God. The sp specific or special revelation goes out that there is a God who wants to be reconciled with you through Christ Jesus our Lord. That it goes out. And we have a responsibility to respond. Open door for anyone to enter by faith. Whosoever may come to his arms, to, to come to his open arms, the divine provision is offered impartial to all. Impartially to all. Those who choose to believe in Christ Jesus will be saved. Vicarious atonement. Uh, sorry, yeah, victorious atonement. The divine provision is of sufficient value for sins of the whole world and provides a way for anyone to be saved by Christ's blood. His death is effective to the whosoever believe in Christ Jesus. Illuminating grace. The divine provision is offered sufficiently for all and provides clear revealed truth so that all can know and respond in faith. And this is Jesus being lifted up upon the cross. This is the free gift of God offered to all clearly, simply, uttered to the world that God has appointed the day that the world will be judged by the man who has been raised from the grave and that this is the gospel of grace gone out to all of humanity. And then destroyed. Sinners are condemned for their unbelief and resisting the Holy Spirit's drawing to God's mercy. This is the divine provision of justice. And then eternal security. Divine provision is everlasting for all true believers. So this is a, a general overview. I know it's a little bit of a longer video, but this is a whole general overview of the soteriological or the doctrine of salvation views within evangelical Christianity, within Protestant Christianity. There are other views that can be looked at, but these are the four main players on the field that I would definitely look at free grace and provisionism and say they're they're pretty much one and the same, <laughs> you know, that it's it's pretty much like yeah, there might be some free grace people and some provisionists that disagree with one another. Um, you know, and that's kind of the same thing with Arminianism and Calvinism is that it is kind of like a high and low view of determinism of where it's just like free grace and provisionism are, you know, the ball is in man's court because God has brought it forth, because of the life made manifest, because of the witness of the church, because of the witness of the Holy Spirit, because of the witness of the blood and the water, this is all on humanity's play field of will you accept it or not? Will you receive this amazing grace given to you all? That is the difference of of these of these four is that you know they one you know two group two of them are grouped over here and two of them are grouped over here, where it's like there's other ones that would say well it's it's you know man can make his way and it's like none. As you can clearly hear, none of them have stated that. All four views agreed with the fact that as man is sinful and man is unable, and therefore we need to respond. We need to respond. We you know we disagree with these two, Arminianism and Calvinism, and we more readily you know personally. And I, I'm not going to war with you on on whether you agree with these or not. You know as we continue this study. I'll definitely go into more of like, this is what I believe, and this is why I believe it, which is why we're here as a church to equip and encourage one another to aim to stir up one another until the, until the day of Jesus comes. As the day draws near, we are to continue to meet and encourage one another, uh, whether that be in person or through social media. 
Um, I just want to thank you once again uh, for uh, sticking with me. Uh, it was really enjoyable. I hope and pray you have a blessed day. And uh, may God just encourage you as you study scripture. Um, Lord bless you. Have a great day.